Uh, Bill Evans is coming to preach this morning. It's been a while since he's been here, uh, about a year or so. And uh, this virus has sort of got things all messed up for us. But we praise the Lord. God's still in control. Even, even this virus and everything, he knows all about it. So we look forward to hearing from Brother Bill. Good morning to you. Take your Bibles and turn with me to John chapter 19, verse 30. John chapter 19, verse 30. And I look and I see myself, and that's kind of scary. So I got to figure out which side I look best from. I was supposed to come back in March, and the virus took over, and Ken called me and said, I'm sorry you can't come. So I've been saving this sermon for, what, six months now. And I'm teasing. Uh, it's wonderful to be in God's house with God's people. It has been such a disappointment these last few months not being able to gather with God's people. Uh, I read some statistics here some time ago, and it mentioned because of the virus that one out of three people will not come back to church, and then one out of five churches will close in the next 18 months, which sounds kind of bad, but if you turn it around, 
And you say, well, you know, two-thirds of the people are going to come back. Now, that sounds pretty good, putting it that way. And only one out of five churches is closing because of the virus. We have a God that's still in control. And so take your Bibles, if you will, John chapter 19, verse 30. And as I began to pray about where do I go today, I had several thought directions to go. And then I guess it was Thursday as I was studying, the Lord laid on my heart, let's go back to Calvary. Let's go back to Calvary. So this morning, I would like to take you back to the crucifixion, the place where Jesus Christ died so that we could have eternal life, the place where Jesus Christ shed his precious blood so he could wash away our sins. As Jesus hung upon the cross, he spoke five or seven different times. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's believed that Jesus said this numerous times. As he was being beaten with the cat of nine tails, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. As they planted the corn, uh, crown of thorns upon his head, it's believed that Jesus said this. As he was being nailed to the cross, it's believed that Jesus also said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. But here we see Jesus hanging suspended between heaven and hell, and he turns to the Father and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. On either side of Jesus is a criminal. One looked at Jesus and he said, if you be the Christ, why don't you come down from the cross and save yourself and save us? But the other said, no, you stay on the cross. And when you come into your kingdom, remember me. And Jesus said to him, this day shalt thou be with me in paradise. As we look at the cross and will continue, we see the mother of Jesus, Mary. I can imagine Mary kneeling at the foot of the cross. And can you imagine what must have been going through her, her mindset, looking up at her son who was dying, knowing that he had committed no sin whatsoever, thinking about the times that she held those little hands in her hands and washed those little feet. And she, Jesus looks at her and he also looks at John and he says, John, Behold thy mother, woman, behold thy son. It is at this point in history that the son of Mary became the savior of Mary. For Jesus to be her savior, he had to die. Then we find Jesus saying, I thirst, I thirst. No wonder Jesus said, I thirst. He'd been hanging upon that cross for three hours we see him as he had been beaten the night before. He had been up all night and he said, I thirst. But then about 12 o'clock, from 9 to 12 o'clock, Jesus hung there. But then around 12 o'clock, the Bible says that there was total darkness, midnight darkness. You could not see your hand in front of your face. And it's at this point that Jesus took upon himself the sin of all mankind God, not able to look upon him, his sin, turned his back on his son. And Jesus says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then we come to our passage this morning. In John chapter 19, verse 30, Jesus had taken a sip and he looked toward heaven and he said, it is finished. It is finished. Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And the Bible says that Jesus died. When I think about the phrase, it is finished, I ask myself, what was finished? We think about, well, the plan of salvation. We think about the fact that the sin was paid for once and for all. No more sacrifices. No more death. Jesus paid it all. There are five things I'd like to think about this morning. And as I think about these things, I have to remind you that this outline is not mine. I don't know where it came from, but I can't take credit for it. But whoever did it, I thought did a pretty good job. First of all, we think about one lamb for one person, one lamb for one family, one lamb for one nation, and one lamb for one 
world. We have to go all the way back to the very beginning. <clears throat> Keep in mind, before there was a creation in the mind of God, we looked at the fact that there was a Calvary. God may have made the world, but Jesus made the way. Adam and Eve had been created by God and placed in the Garden of Eden and given one commandment. Look around you. You can eat of every fruit except one or every tree except one, and that is a knowledge of good and evil. And they had barely gotten settled in when Satan came along and said, listen, don't listen to God. He's limiting you. If you want to be like God, all you have to do is just reach out and take and eat. And they did. They listened to the deceiving thoughts of Satan and ignored the promises of God. And they took of the fruit and they ate. And in doing so, they introduced sin into the world. And when they looked at themselves, they saw they were naked and they went and hid. God usually would come in the afternoon. And as God came in the afternoon, he looked around and said, Adam, Adam, where are you? And then we know that God knew exactly where Adam was. Adam was not hiding from God. But God wanted Adam to recognize what he had done. And in the course of the conversation that followed, of course, Adam blamed God. He said, it was a woman that you gave me, God. And of course, Eve blamed Satan. And we always are blaming someone else and not taking the results of the consequences that we have done upon ourselves. And so we look at this, and because of this, the Bible says that God slew an animal, believed to be a lamb, and in doing so, he provided a covering for Adam and Eve. They're cast from the garden, and a family is developed, Cain and Abel. Once again, we find that God requires a blood sacrifice. In the book of Hebrews, the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And so it came time for the sacrifice. We find that Cain uh, was a farmer and he brought from the vegetables that he had created and God didn't accept it. Abel, on the other hand, slew a lamb and God accepted the blood sacrifice. And be Cain became so upset that when God did not accept his sacrifice, he, in other words, said, well, I'll give you a sacrifice, and he killed his brother Abel. But here we find that it was one sacrifice or one lamb for one person. Abel's sacrifice was not sufficient for Cain. It was one sacrifice or one lamb for one person. But let's fast forward. We find ourselves... As we're looking at the nation of Israel, and Moses had instructed the fathers to kill a lamb and sprinkle the blood on either side of the doorpost. If we back up, we'll find that the story that preceded that was the fact that God had called Moses to deliver the Israelites. And it was a, after a series of 10 plagues, they came to the 10th plague. And as we look at this 10th plague, God had required a blood sacrifice. The father was to simple, simply take the blood of a lamb that was slain and sprinkle it on either side of the doorpost and across the top. And that night as the death angel came through, seeing the blood upon the doorpost would pass over that. And so there was a trail of blood that went all through Egypt that night as a death angel came. The blood sacrifice, which was on the doorpost, protected the family behind. You see, this father's sacrifice did not protect anyone else, only the ones behind his door. And so we fast forward. We find ourselves out in the wilderness. And once again, we find the Day of Atonement on a certain day of the year, on the Day of Atonement, a lamb had to be slain. Now we come to the fact it is one lamb for one nation. God required 
a sacrifice. We notice this, that the high priest on the Day of Atonement would take the blood of the lamb which was slain and he would go into the Holy of Holies and there he would stand in the Holy of Holies and wait for the Shekinah glory of God taking the blood and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat and here he was for three hours and after three hours and God had accepted the sacrifice, the high priest would come out where the people were, they were still waiting, and the high priest would raise his hands and he would say, it is finished. God has accepted the sacrifice. Right. So we see one lamb for one person, one lamb for one family, one lamb for one nation. But let's fast forward. Jesus has been born into this world. We don't know much about the life of the Lord Jesus Christ up until he's around 30 years of age. John the Baptist, the popular preacher, teacher of that day, is teaching and preaching. And Jesus came by and John the Baptist said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Now, these Israelites could identify with sacrifices. They had been making sacrifices all of their lives. But John said something different. He said, behold, the lamb of God. This was not their lamb. This was not their sacrifice. It was God's sacrifice. Amen. Behold, the lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of all the world. Amen. And so we follow Jesus to the cross. And that's where we come this morning. We see Jesus as his hands have been nailed to the cross. He's handing, hanging there suspended between heaven and hell. And he cries, Father, it is finished. The job that you gave me to do is over. You see, Calvary was not an afterthought of God. The Bible tells us that Jesus was, Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world. So before there was a creation in the mind of God, there was a Calvary. When Adam and Eve sinned, it didn't catch God off guard. He knew exactly what was going to place, take place. So therefore, a sacrifice had to be made. And Jesus volunteered very, from the very beginning, I will go and I will be that one sacrifice. So there upon the cross, as Jesus is hanging, and all of a sudden, after three hours of darkness, the sun begins to come out. And Jesus, with all of his strength, looks toward heaven and he cries out, It is finished! It is finished! Into thy hands I commit my spirit. And Jesus died. The story could stop there, but praise God it doesn't. The price was paid for. It meant that none of us have to face death, spiritual death. It means that none of us have to die and go to a devil's hell. Do you mean, preacher, you believe in hell? Yes, I do. I believe that there's a heaven, and I believe that there's a hell. I believe that there's a place where the Christians go, and I believe there's a place where the unsaved go. And so when Jesus died, he made it possible so that no one has to go to a devil's hell. But here is Jesus. He's died. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea go to Pilate and ask permission for the body of Jesus to be taken down. And it has been. And they place it in the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. And there a, a stone is rolled in front of the door and a Roman seal is placed on it. But keep in mind what has taken place. One lamb for one person. One lamb for one family. One lamb for one nation. And now it's one lamb for one world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting eternal 
life. Jesus is in the tomb. He's been there Friday. There was a colored preacher years ago had a sermon. It's Friday, but Sundays are coming. I like to think about that. It's Friday, but Sundays are coming. Can you imagine Easter Sunday morning when God raised up? Of course, the Bible says God doesn't slumber, God doesn't sleep, but I kind of think about him getting up on Sunday morning, Easter Sunday morning, and he calls all the angels together and he says, today is Resurrection Sunday. I need a volunteer who will go. And I can imagine every angel in the heaven raised their hand and said, yes, Father, I will go. And finally, the Father chose one. And that angel descended from the very portals of glory down to this earth. The Bible says something interesting happened. The Bible says that the earth shook. There was a great earthquake. And I like to think about the angel breaking the sound barrier. You ever heard a jet plane go over and it just shakes? I think that angel came down so fast, it broke the sound barrier. It walks up to the stone and rolls the stone away and sits upon the stone. Have you ever asked yourself the question, why did the angel sit upon the stone? Let me tell you, it was the best seat in the house because the eternal Son of God was going to walk out of that tomb alive. Listen, we don't serve a dead God. We serve a risen Savior. And the Bible tells us that 40 days later, Jesus took his disciples outside of Jerusalem, and there in plain view, the Bible says that he ascended into heaven. And the angel said to those disciples as they were looking up, I mean, he kind of disappeared and he's gone. You men of Galilee, why stand you here gazing? The same Jesus that you have seen go away is coming again as you have seen him go. Can you imagine what must have taken place when Jesus walks into heaven? The angels have watched him. Those angels watched Jesus be crucified and could do nothing about it. But all of a sudden, Jesus, the Son of God, is walking down the streets of gold, and probably those angels were singing, it is finished. (laughs) It is finished, the battle is over. It's finished, no more pain. It is finished. The price has been paid. Now let's think about today. That plan of redemption that took place on Calvary's cross 2,000 years ago is sufficient for you today. Jesus can change your life. Jesus can change your destiny by accepting him as your personal savior. Brother Bill, how do I do that? It's very simple. Acknowledge the fact that I'm a sinner. I'm lost without the Lord Jesus Christ. And I ask Jesus Christ to forgive my sin and come into my heart and save me. And Jesus does. He saves me from the power of sin. He saves me from the penalty of sin. And he saves me from the results of sin. You see, how does he save me from the power of sin? Sin is a very powerful thing. The closer we get to God, the stronger we are to defend ourselves against Satan. And that comes through the leadership of the Holy Spirit. You know, I used to think about when I got so high up the pedestal in my spiritual life, Satan was not going to be bothering me. I came to the conclusion that's not right because I become a better target when I'm up here. But Jesus because of what took place at Calvary, gives us the ability not only to be saved, but to defend ourselves against Satan. And one of these days, we're going to be taken from this world. I've asked myself the question, what would it be like if Jesus raptured the church? I thought, man, what a fantastic thought that is. But one of these days, Jesus is going to step from the portals of heaven He's going to stand at the universe and he's going to shout, come. 
And as he shouts, come, the archangel is going to echo, come. And God is going to take his trumpet and blow it. And all of a sudden, the Bible says there's going to be some things change. First of all, the dead in Christ, those who have died, their bodies have been buried. Jesus is bringing with him the spirits of those who have died. That glorified body is coming out of that grave and they're going to be united together. Then those of us that remain that know Jesus Christ as our personal Savior are going to be taken out of this world. And as we're taken out, we're going to receive that glorified body. And we're going to look at ourselves and say, man, it's finished. It's finished. Up until that time, we have the assurance of knowing the Holy Spirit is with us all the time. He says, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. I forgot my cell phone this morning, but I'm glad I, Andrew is here. A couple years ago, my oldest son, Russ, I may have mentioned this before, gave me a smartphone. He said, Dad, you don't need this dumb phone. You need a smartphone. And so he gave me a smartphone. And on this smartphone, it's got this thing called Find Me. And so a couple years ago, Andrew and John were leaving, and I said, Now, Andrew, keep in mind that Papa Bill knows exactly where you are all the time. I can follow you. And he smiled and said, That's okay, Papa Bill. We'll know where you are too. <laughs> but there's a spiritual application. For that phone to work, there has to be three satellites to pinpoint my location or anyone's location. You and I have God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit watching over us all the time. And God knows exactly who we are, where we are, and what we're going through. And he says, I care about you. I love you. It's finished. Jesus took a sip. And after he had taken the sip, he looks toward heaven and says, Father, it's finished. Into thy hands I commit my spirit. Father God, how thankful I am this morning for your love and for your goodness. How thankful I am that you went to a Roman cross and there you died so that each one of us could have eternal life. Did it hurt? Yes. Was it sad when you were separated from the Father? I'm sure it was. But Father, you stayed there. And it was not the nails that held you to the cross. Not the spikes in your hands and in your feet, but it was love. The love for all mankind, the love for us today. Because you looked ahead 2,000 years and you saw us. And Father, thank you for going to the cross. And thank you for the plan of salvation. And Father, sometimes we are discouraged in this life. But I pray this morning that your Holy Spirit would remind each one of us that you're here for us and that you love us. And there's a possibility one has never received you as Lord and Savior. I pray that as you speak to that heart, to the person of the Holy Spirit, they would respond to your voice, allowing you to change their life and change their destiny because of what you did 2,000 years ago upon the Roman cross. In your name I pray, amen. amen. If you'd like to come to the altar this morning and pray, then the altar is open. I invite you to come.
Father God, again, thank you for today. Thank you for these people. And thank you for their love for you and for their love for this church. And I pray as we leave this your house today, we would go with that realization of knowing you are aware of our presence, where we are, who we are, and what we're going through. Thank you, dear Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for allowing us to come.